I have a question for you. Now, I, I want to hear your best impression. Now, you know what an impression is? An impression is you, are, you make a sound like something, okay? Like if you're doing an impression of a person, you're trying to make yourself sound like that person, okay? So if I, you did an impression of me, you would, try, you would try to sound like me. You would talk to somebody else and say, I'm doing an impression of Pastor Tim. But I want you to do an impression of a trumpet. You know what a trumpet is? Can you do an impression of a, your best impression of a trumpet? Let me hear one of you. Trumpet. You want me to give you mine first? Can you do that? Can you make the impression of a trumpet? You can't do that? You can. There you go. Somebody else. Do your best impression of a trumpet. See? Go ahead. Do I have to come back to you again? Yeah. Ruby, you're always able to do stuff like that. Come on. What's your best impression of a trumpet? Make your best trumpet sound. No? Gabby? Oh, you girls. You're acting like you're shy girls that never do. Come on. I know better. How about you, Charlie? You got your jazz trumpet there. We'll take that. We'll take that. Well, I want to tell you something important about trumpets. Do you know trumpets were really important, have always been important for lots of different reasons, but they've always been important for the people of God too. The trumpet, they blew the trumpet, which a lot of times was an animal horn. That's an interesting horn to try to blow. But they would blow that horn, sometimes a ram, yeah? They would blow that horn to remind people of something. And one of the important things that they reminded people of, when they blew the trumpet, people were supposed to stop and think about their own sin, the bad things that they'd done in their life, and that God was the only one who could clean that. So that's why they used the trumpet, to, to remind them, to take the time. So if you hear a trumpet, it's a good time to say, Jesus, show me that I show me what's going on in my heart. Make sure that I'm living the way you want me to live and making the decisions you want me to make, doing the things you want me to do. The next time you hear a trumpet, you can ask Jesus and the Holy Spirit will show you. Can do that. Now, can we do a trumpet together if I count to three? Let's try that. On the count of three. One, two, three. Doo, doo, doo. See, you can do it. All right, Mr. Max has a special lesson for you guys this morning, and he wants to teach you. He wants to teach you something that you may never have known before. But if you do know it, it'll be new, or it, it might be new to somebody else, but you will remember. Yes, ma'am? She was doing an impression of your Nana, wasn't she? At your new house door. Yep, that's what it is. Well, while they're back there for the next few minutes, I want to share something with you that the Lord's been laying on my heart. Um, we continue in 1 John, 1 John chapter 3. I'll get there myself. The title this morning is The Evidence is Clear. But the question that we have to answer is, what does the evidence say? And I didn't write the rest of, of that out, but what does the evidence say about me? What does the evidence of my life, of the way that I live, the things that I do, the, my attitudes and actions and all that, what does the evidence say about me? And that's what we're asking this morning. Hey, David, can you step out into the foyer? I think someone needs something out there. Yeah. 
We're in 1 John. That was odd. 1 John chapter 3, beginning at verse 4. Would you stand with me, please, as we read God's Word? 1 John chapter 3, beginning at verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law, or lawlessness. And ye know that he was manifested, or made known, to take away our sins. And in him, Jesus, is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, or does not practice sinning. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness, or practices righteousness, is righteous, even as he, Christ, is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, or made known, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed, Christ's seed, remaineth in him. And he cannot, or as a a regular practice, does not sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest or made known, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye have heard. There we go. There we go. My light is a little odd this morning for me. For this is the message that we heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. I'll pause there, and let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and ask that you would speak your word into our hearts, that we would hear through your Holy Spirit's filter what we need to hear, so that we will be more like you. We ask it all in your precious name, Jesus, for your sake, for your glory. Speak to us, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Verse 17, picking that up to the end of the chapter. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue or by talk, but in deed and in truth, means in action. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he, Christ, in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. This morning, we're going to do a a few verses. The little VS thing. Versus, not verses. We're going to talk a little bit about different opposites this morning. But I wanted to start with this quote from Harvey Blaney in his commentary on this passage. He says, God never makes demands to which we cannot attain. He always provides the capability. Make sure you catch that. God never makes demands to which we cannot attain. Hey Reuben, why don't you jump on the roof for me? Just jump, just stand beside the roof and jump on the roof. Can you do that? 
that would be like asking you something you couldn't possibly do. But what if I, with your mother's permission, said, here's a ladder, will you climb onto the roof? Could you do it then? See? That's what it's like when God makes a way. He does not ask us to do what it is impossible for us to do. He provides the capability. He provides what we need. His Holy Spirit provides what you and I need. So, let's start here. Not sure why all that's flashing. The first pair. Sin versus righteousness. The reality is that sin exists. People sin. People do things that God doesn't want them to do. But here's our definition of sin. It's not just not being all that God wants you to be. The definition for sin that we're using is a little more specific than that. The sin that we're talking about is a willful transgression, a willful action against the known law of God, something you know. God has made it known to you. Now, the problem is, occasionally people say, well, if I don't read God's Word or I don't listen in service, then I'm not accountable for anything that the pastor said or that the Word says, and so God won't hold me accountable. That's not an excuse. What we're talking about this morning is that God has made it available to you to know. When you sin, it is making a choice to do something that God does not want you to do. Or failing to do something that He does want you to do. That's the definition of sin. And with that... You don't simply sin by walking through your day and breathing. It is a choice. It's a choice to do something you know is not right or a choice to not do something you know is wrong. Not do something you know is right. Do something you know is wrong. Don't listen to what I'm saying. Just listen to how the Holy Spirit's fixing it in your head. Because sometimes I make mistakes. My And... My tongue is getting tied these days a little bit more often than others. So how should we live? In John's passage, he's reminding his followers. He refers to them as little children. This is part of his family. Now they're not children of his, his own personal biological family. But it's the family of believers that he has gathered, that he has been teaching, that he's been talking to. You understand that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. For a coach, when he says, boys, I want you to win this game, he's not thinking of you as his own personal sons that are biological, but the fact that you've been in this group working together and learning together Helps you become part of the whole. When my son was in marching band, it was always we won or we lost or we need to work harder. There were 200 plus people in that marching band. But they were working together. And so when they celebrated, they celebrated as one group. When they commiserated, when they lost, they commiserated as one group. Well, for you and me, as part of the church, the body of believers, those who have said, yes, Jesus, I want you to forgive my sins and I want the new life that you offer. A new life that looks at the old and forgives it and gives us new life. Christ says that we will live like righteous people. Not because it's our righteousness, but because it is Christ's righteousness being shown in us. Have you ever heard anyone say to you before, you look like your mom, or you look like your dad, or you look like your grandmother, or your grandfather, or you sound like them when you say that, or... 
when you do that thing, I found out that when I concentrate hard on something, and I wasn't paying attention yesterday, it might have been happening then, usually is because it's kind of subconscious. When I start concentrating on something, and I was screwing in some attachments for the balusters, I have a tendency to stick my tongue out. I discovered, I knew I did that as a child, but when I became an adult, I realized that my grandfather did that. I hadn't paid any attention to that, and it certainly wasn't something conscious. But when somebody says to you, oh, that looks like your mom or your dad, or that looks like your, your aunt or your uncle, well, that's what John is saying to his people. The way you live should look like Jesus. Because it's Jesus' righteousness that you've been given. And this is a habit that I didn't come up with on my own. It came through my DNA. It's part of who I was before I was born. And so, the righteousness of Christ, we've been given from Christ. And it changes who we are. And it makes us new. And so the righteous, the right things that we do, show others that we're no longer living for sin, that we're no longer living a life that is filled with sin and live by the standards of a sinful life. But instead, we live by a standard of Christ. But what if we make a mistake? What if we do a stupid thing? What if we make a bad decision, even knowing it? Well, John's already said, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, and we can be forgiven for sin But sin isn't just swept under the rug or ignored. So how should we live? John is saying, you were once in sin, but you've been changed. You have been transformed by the power of God through Christ Jesus and His righteousness. So your life now should be a life of righteousness. So, Next pair, love versus hate. What is our motivation? John says throughout this passage that the motivation to love others comes from Jesus. It comes from Him living in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. That we love others not because they're lovable, you know what, Mary Beth? I don't know if you'd be lovable if Jesus didn't live in here. You know what I also know? I'm pretty certain I wouldn't be lovable if Jesus didn't live in you. See, the reality is we love not because other people deserve love, not because it's their right for you to love them. We, we talk about those kinds of things in this day and age a lot. But people can be very bad. Sometimes we talk about how wonderful children are. If we just were like children. Have you ever watched children fight over toys? Take their toy and say they're going home or they're going to their room or you're not touching their thing anymore? It starts early. I mean, that's our human nature. Our human nature is selfishness. And John equates this selfishness with hatred. Because I can't love you unless Jesus lives in me. I can't genuinely love you. Oh, I may do things for you, but you'll do something for me later. You'll owe me. That's a completely different kind of motivation. The motivation that comes from the love of Jesus Christ is the motivation that says, I love you because Christ loves you. There's no other qualifier. Not because of the color of your skin. Not because of the things that you say. Not because of the things you can do for me. Not because you're just the most wonderful person in the world. But I can love you because Jesus has put his love inside of me. And that becomes the filter that we see everyone through. What's our motivation? Love or hate? John says most often as sinners... We're motivated by hate. 
Because our selfishness says, I'm the most important. The love of Jesus Christ says, you're more important. Why do we go on missions trips? Why do we give things to others? Why do we sacrifice from our own lives so that others may have? Certainly not out of selfishness. I mean, most of the places that we've ever done missions work and the things that we, uh, we hear about through missions study with Travis and all, those are times when people selflessly give. You work more hours of the day than you would want to, doing something for somebody else that you may never see or take part in. Jeremy and Emily got to go down and do a missions trip a long way away. We fortunately had a little bit more to do with some of that through a missionary that they met who said he would never be a missionary or go back to the country, and that's where he's at, and that's what he's doing, because he did say yes to Jesus. But you guys haven't been able to take advantage of those plush rooms that you helped build, right, down there in that school? You see, we do selflessly because Jesus lives in here. So our motivation becomes, I do this because Jesus loves you. And I'm supposed to be the hands and feet and mouth and attitude of Jesus because he lives in me. So I love you. Not because of what you can do for me or what you can bring into my life. I mean, there are benefits That's the reality. We have brothers and sisters in Christ, and it's awesome to be a part of the family of Christ. But you disappoint me, and I disappoint you. But we love one another because Jesus loved us first. So our motivation becomes love as opposed to hate or selfishness. The last part of this passage that we read has the final pair. Action versus inaction. And John is asking the question in a whole lot more words than these four. But he's asking this question. Is it just talk? Sometimes the church, the body of Christ, the body of believers can get off kilter with what our purpose, with what our mission is. And we can talk about all of the things that need to happen, the things that should be done, the way that we should live or who we should help and what we should do. And forget that unless that's followed up by doing, then it doesn't really matter. In a lot of ways... We're a mixed congregation racially. And we started a Hispanic congregation of several years back, and they've moved out, and now they've moved back in because their, their building burned down, and so they're in our gymnasium this morning. But in a lot of ways, we're a mixed race congregation. Now, we don't walk around and say, well, you're this race and you're that race. And the reality is, you walk through the doors. You're part of the body of Christ for us. You're our brothers and sisters, and the color of your skin doesn't matter. Do you know what that is? It's action instead of talk. We can talk about justice, and we can talk about grand things that we want to see happen, and sometimes they get so big and so grand, they're so far away that we don't have to worry about them. But where the rubber meets the road, where it really matters, is to be able to say to brothers and sisters, no matter what their language, no matter what their differences may be, and there's a whole lot more differences in this world than the color of our skin. But no matter what the differences are, when the rubber meets the road, if we genuinely love one another like Jesus loves us, then we're putting feet to our talk that says we should be people that love. Do you ever find it fascinating that in the passages 
of Scripture that we so often go to in the New Testament that the people that are speaking, the people that are writing, and the people that they're talking about usually have a very different color skin to what we have. Most of us, as a matter of fact, probably all of us. But Jesus was saying to them, and they are saying to their followers on and on and over and over, what Jesus came to do was break down the barriers. And as he breaks down those barriers, what happens is we love each other genuinely. Not because you're something or because you're not or because you do, but we simply love each other in action, in reality, not just talk. What John is reminding us is that the evidence is clear whether we are living a life of sin or righteousness. The evidence is clear in our life. It's clearly visible whether we're living a life of love or a life of hate. And it is clearly visible if we are living a life that is filled with action instead of mere words. We're in the political season now. Somebody said the other day, I'm really ready for all of these political ads to end. Well, it's August. That's not till November. I'm ready for them to have ended in March. Um, But every season, what you and I hear are politicians trying to be reelected. And sometimes they have things that they believe in. More often than not, however, the vast majority of politicians seem to believe what you believe right now, whatever that may be, at this time, in this situation, for this moment. And they'll make promises. They'll make grand promises. I will be 59 years old in two days. The first election that I remember vividly in my mind was Richard Nixon. Yes, Travis, it means I'm old. But that's the first one that I remember. And I've paid attention to elections ever since then. And every one of them is going to do away with the poor. think there are still poor people with us. Every one of them is going to fix racial injustice. And it's still there. Every one of them is going to balance the budget and not cut Social Security and spend enough on defense and to provide something for everyone all the time. Forgetting that you can't spend what you don't have. I could tell you all day that I'm going to pay for your vacation. And you'd love me for that. But I can't follow through with that. Barely pay for my own vacation. Here's what John is reminding us of. It's not about talking a good talk. It is about walking the walk. It's about doing what we're supposed to do. We can say we're Christian. We can say that we want this or we want that or we want to do this. But unless we're actually doing these things, unless we're actually living it, then it's just talk. It's still just talk. And words aren't worth much if they're not backed up by action. The church has discovered this, sometimes unfortunately, in difficult ways. When people have said, If the church is supposed to be a group of people who follow Christ, why don't they look like it? 
There's two parts to that story. One is none of us is perfect and we won't be the rest of our lives and we will disappoint each other. So we have to have a a grace-filled way of looking at one another. However, way too often, the church, the body of Christ, the body of believers, has said we believe these things, but haven't lived like we believe these things. In our class this morning, in our membership class, um, was talking about the fact that the Church of the Nazarene, the, the, the word origin for the Church of the Nazarene, the, our founding fathers of the church, chose that because Jesus was referred to as a Nazarene, which in his day and age was referring to him as a... Pl- a poor person from a poor place where nothing significant ever happens. And so the church of the Nazarene is a church for people who may very well feel, or it may be reality, that they have very little. That to some they mean very little. But the church of the Nazarene is a reminder That Jesus Christ came to die for the sins of all people and that at his table, everyone is welcome. No matter what any differences are, we come to the table of Jesus and we are free. We're free by him. We're free from the boundaries that could separate us. I could ask Esther to pray for me, and I know that that's what she's going to do. She's my sister in Christ. Our backgrounds have nothing to do with that. Our new life that we're living in Christ makes that possible. The question we have to ask ourselves is what does the evidence say about me? What does the evidence, the thing that becomes clear to everyone, clear to people that I interact with, clear to people I live around, clear to everyone in my realm of influence, clear to the people that I love or don't love, clear to the people that I hate or don't hate, clear to the people that see the sin or righteousness clear to the Father who sees whatever we do in secret, who knows our mind and our heart. When the evidence is clear, what does it say about me? Would you stand with me, please? Let's bow our heads together as we close in prayer. Lord, We need you to look deep in us. And quite frankly, it's not always comfortable. But we ask, Lord, right now in these moments that you would look into us and show us. Show us what the evidence says about us, about whether we're following you or just talk about following you, whether the evidence shows that we love as you love or whether it's just talk. Shine the light into our own heart and mind, into our soul, and show us through the Holy Spirit the reality Of where we are. And show us Lord that. You don't ask us to do. What we cannot do. You provide the way. So no matter what you show us. About ourselves. You will make a way. To fix it. To correct it. To expand it. You will make a way. 
And we ask, Lord, this morning that you would show us not only who we really are, but show us, Lord, how to reflect you and show us that you make it possible. Lord, have your way in us. We are yours. We choose today to say, do everything in me, Lord, that you want to do. I give you complete right of way. I give you control, Holy Spirit, to make me like Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that not only do you show us who we are, you shine a light on the reality of who we are within, but you also love us enough to make a way, to make it possible for us to be like you. Thank you. We praise you because we are not what we used to be. Not by our righteousness, but by your grace and mercy and your righteousness that you give to us. We can love like you love because you have filled us with your love, not because we have garnered the strength on our own. And we can live a life that truly reflects you by your power living in us. We thank you, we praise you, and we honor you. We give you this day and ourselves. Glorify your name. Lift up your holy name. We ask it in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning.